Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ryan and welcome to Central Park. We know that getting to Central Park is still difficult for a lot of people. So we wanna continue bringing the park to you, offering both in-person tours as well as longer 45 minute virtual tours. And of course, our regular Wednesday 15 minute weekly walks. Welcome and thank you again for joining us. My name is Ryan, and today we're going to be taking a weekly walk called Central Park Rocks on today, February 16th, 2022. Today, you might have guessed, we're going to be together for about 15 minutes as we make our way through the park, with our topic being one of the most incredible parts of Central Park, the bedrock that we can see exposed all over New York, and especially prominent still here in Central Park today. Now, again, we're going to be together for about 15 minutes on our weekly walk, and all the photos you're going to see were taken by myself here in the park over the past few days, with the exception of one or two photos that I accessed using various databases like the Museum of the City of New York. All right. Now, as we jump into our, now as we jump into our walk, just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. We again are members here at the Central Park Conservancy, and we're the main caretakers of Central Park. Our mission being to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and well being of all. And thank you again so much for the support as we make our way through the park today and every day. Uh, we are using Zoom. Now, if you do want to say hello, please use the chat feature to let us know where you're joining us from. If you do want to close the chat feature, you can use the X button to close it out. And if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature. And my colleague Jose will be on the back end answering any questions that you might have. Last thing you'll see pop up are gonna be some visitor polls that I'll launch throughout the walk. And once everybody has voted in those, I'll share the results and we can see what everybody is thinking. Now, without any further ado, let's jump into our weekly walk today, where we're gonna again be looking at the beautiful rocks of Central Park. One last thing though, before we begin, we do have a lot of specialty program coming up and we have a couple of wonderful programs occurring tomorrow. Tomorrow in honor of Black History Month, we will be having two Seneca Village tours, an in-person tour at 11 a.m. as well as a virtual Seneca Village tour at 2 p.m. You can check the chat box for links for those programs that my colleague Jose will drop. The last thing uh, that you'll also notice occurring tomorrow, a very specialty one-time program, a a creation of Frederick Douglass Circle Monument, a very special gateway to Harlem tour. It's gonna to be a virtual tour occurring tomorrow, Thursday, February 17th at 6.30. And on this tour, you can explore the history and development of this public monument by the Harlem Mirror that honors African-American orator and abolitionist Frederick Douglass. And we're gonna have our um, one of our conservancy's director of community engagement, John T. Reddick, discussing this wonderful project and the conservancy's engagement with the Harlem community local public officials, and artistic talent to create this really beautiful and unique monument. If you do uh, scan the code here or write down that code, you can get $5 off this specialty program. And we would love to see you there learning a little bit about this really amazing area in the northern section of Central Park. All right, now without any further ado, let's jump into our Central Park Rocks Weekly Walk. I uh, hope you like that little pun of a title we have for this walk. And of course, Central Park does rock and the rocks in it help to really add so much to its character. As we explore around the park today, we can learn about some of these rocks, many of which came in the Paleozoic era, which was between about 540 and 251 million years ago. As we make our way into the park, we're gonna start down at 59th Street and Fifth Avenue, Fifth Avenue right, near, uh, right near, sorry, Grand Army Plaza. And as we enter in the park, we can immediately start diving in to see some of the natural beauty, but enjoy some of the little sights we pass along the way, like the Lombard lamp, which we can see pictured here on the left. As we make our way past this lamp, we'll dive into the park because what we really came to see is not architecture, but really the natural architecture of the park. And as we enter the park, we immediately start to see some geology and rocks around. The walls of Central Park are made of rock, mostly of sandstone, which we can see variously constructed around the park, adding a little bit of a wall that helps to block out some of the surrounding city sites that we don't love so much. As we make our way down past these walls, we'll start to feel a little bit more surrounded by the park. And as we start to see some of the naturalistic beauty, we can also see some of the major players in the park's beauty, the bedrock. 
we're going to see a few different types of bedrock all throughout New York. But we're primarily going to see one here in Central Park. I'm actually going to launch our first poll, which is to see if you'd like to take a guess as to what the oldest New York City bedrock is. We'll find three different types of bedrock throughout New York City, Fordham Nice, Manhattan Schist, and Inwood Marble. Primarily in Central Park, we're going to see a lot of schist, which comes in about maybe about three or so different groups, but largely being conglomerates of other types of sedimentary stones. I'll let everybody vote in this poll for just a little bit, and then I'll share the results. But as we make our way closer down along the 69th Street section of the park, we can enjoy our first little cropping of bedrock, Manhattan schist. And Manhattan schist, again, is a conglomerate of a few different types of stone really mixed together, really spawning originally from some shale that went, uh, went through some metamorphic types of processes, basically a lot of heat and pressure. And some of it rolls into other types of stones and beauty that we can find throughout the schist, like this little flaky iridescent type of piece, which is known as mica. M-I-C-A. Mica is one of the most common stones we can find appearing throughout the Manhattan schist, adding a little bit of glimmer and iridescence to it. And we can see the mica in the back part of this photo just sparkling in the sunshine, adding really just such an amazing glittery effect to this exposed bedrock all throughout Central Park. And as we enjoy this rock, I do want to just end that poll I launched. I see just about most of us have voted in there. Give everybody a few more seconds as I end that. And we're seeing a lot of people are going to be voting Manhattan Schist as the oldest New York City bedrock. Close. The oldest bedrock we're actually going to see is going to be Fordham Nice, but it's followed in a close second by Manhattan Schist, which is about 450 million years old. We'll actually see the order of the rock layer being what's listed here, Fordham Nice, followed by Manhattan Schist, followed by some Inwood Marble. All of these rocks, really beautiful and really historic rocks to have here. Luckily being exposed all throughout the park for us to enjoy. And as we look at these rocks, we can see some of the beautiful striations and effects that they provide. We can also enjoy some of the other little hidden treasures that they might hold, like this U.S. Coast and Geodo Geodoic Survey Mark. These are marks that are put in and operated by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. These different um, types of benchmarks really function to maintain a consistent coordinate system that defines latitude, longitude, height, scale, gravity, and orientation throughout the USA. They can be found all around the USA, and we can find a few of them here in Central Park, like this one down near 59th Street in Central Park's pond. As we make our way to the back side of this rock, we can also enjoy some of the beautiful color that's coming from it. The color coming from some of these different types of moss and vegetative growths. We can see just how green and colorful this moss is as we look at these green leaves of maybe a type of aburnum sticking out the back end. An interesting thing to think about is that moss tends to grow on the northern side of rocks here in the northern hemisphere. So we can actually typically see moss growing on the north side of many rock faces. Although this isn't 100% true all of the time, it commonly is. And we can see this example here with moss growing predominantly on the northwest side of this rock. Pretty interesting as we make our way through the park using rocks to help navigate us. And of course, most of the, rock, most of the park, like the Hallett Nature Sanctuary just across the pond, is really just a bunch of dirt dumped on top of rock. As we start making our way a little bit more northern now, we can see some of the other beautiful landscapes and rock that exist throughout the park. As we wrap up along the pond, we can come to another beautiful rock face known as Overlook Rock, adding a lot of beautiful decoration on the western edge of it. As we climb up this rock and start making our way to the top, we can take a quick moment to admire the backside of this rock, which is beautiful all in its own sense. A little more, um, shorter, so easier for us to climb up, as well as providing us some really interesting uh, types of kind of interesting types of examples with trees really fighting against the bedrock of New York. Many different trees and plants like that little viburnum we saw earlier growing right out of these rocks, adding really interesting root growth and also really just giving some creative uh, styles of growth here, holding on for dear life to this bedrock. 
As we make our way to the top of the rock, we can basically get a tree canopy's point of view as we look over the area we just came from and see how high we actually get from climbing these rocks. The views from up here are immaculate and certainly give us that bird eye sense of view as we look over the pond and the gas out is just below. Manhattan schist certainly can be seen all throughout the park, even not in natural clumps, but also in human-made architecture like the Gapstow Bridge. The Gapstow Bridge was actually originally created around the 1870s. However, it looked a little different. It originally looked like this, being made of cast iron and wood, as well as a little bit of stonework. We actually see this uh, original bridge falling into disrepair and actually being replaced around the mid 1880s. During that mid 1880s replacement, we'd see the current gap style bridge coming. This photo shows the old one around the year 1880 being provided from the Museum of the City of New York. But today we of course have our more traditional Manhattan schist created gap style bridge coming in the 1880s and serving as a nice connection to the bedrock of New York. As we make our way through an arch just opposite of Gapstow, we can go through Inscope and start making our way just through the zoo to come to another favorite rocky area of mine. Now, as we make our way through, we're coming out into the Dean landscape, which has a lot of wonderful different rocks. And these rocks, again, are about 450 million years old. Back during that time, Pangaea, the supercontinent still existed, and land was connected, but not anchored down. They're floating on top of tectonic plates. We do see these plates floating on top of a molten core and eventually starting to shift, starting to break apart, starting to collide, separate, creating earthquakes, volcanoes, and actually creating mountain ranges. We can see continental collisions occur between what is now the East Coast of the United States and North America, which, uh, and um, sorry, between the uh, East Coast of North America and the floor of the Atlantic Ocean, helping to create a lot of different shale layers that would form these mountains, eventually going through metamorphic heat and pressure to create some of the bedrock we can see exposed throughout New York. The intense heat and pressure would create some of these beautiful croppings, like this one just adjacent to the Dean Slope. These beautiful croppings show so many different types of really beauty within them. This transformed shale undergoing a lot of heat and pressure really can create, created conglomerates of different minerals. And we'll see different types of quartz, feldspar, hornblende and mica being present in these rocks to name just a few. We can also see some interesting thing like foliations. Foliations being a lot of these kind of lines and different arrangements of more of a striped appearance of minerals. These are coming from mineral grains that are basically getting squeezed together and then creating a flat foliation when elongated that really create these really cool striped looking mineral pockets. And as we travel around, we can even see some different types of rock found within, different types of quartz like this, as well as granite can be found throughout the Manhattan schist, which adds really just a whole different layer of geology to our exploration of these rocks. Really amazing pockets can be seen all throughout. And we can also notice some of the striations and grooves, which are coming really from a, whis um, really from a large glacier. The Wisconsin, Wisconsin glaciation, which occurred between about 75,000 and 11,000 years ago, helped create a lot of these marks and grooves around it. And we can actually sometimes feel the direction of the glaciers travel by running our hand over. Running our hand over in different directions will tend to find a smoother direction and a more rougher direction. The smoother direction, as you may have guessed, is going to traditionally be the path that this glacier would have moved helping to drag other stones along with it, creating some of these deeper pockets and lines and striations that can be found throughout the rocks, as well as helping sometimes to create the other different mineral pockets we see in some areas. As we make our way past the Dean Slope area, we'll come and see just a few more little areas of rock that I really love through the park, making our way west now coming through the Dean Slope and coming over to a lesser visited patch of rock. This lesser visited patch of rock does offer beautiful striations and markings that help to clearly show that glacier's path, but it also holds another interesting secret over here. A lesser known or visited area is this small little seemingly um, unimportant spike or marking that we can find in a rock face 
somewhat near the Central Park Mall. This little uh, spike that we can see here doesn't look like much, but it's actually a really historic piece of Manhattan's past. This is one of the few remaining grid marker spikes from the 1811 grid system of New York City, which would be applied, allowing today a little bit more free flowing, a little bit more ease of travel amongst New York, having that grid system to separate the island of Manhattan and all of New York, making our travels a little bit more kind of formatted and concise. This grid marker is one of the few that remains, and it's a hidden secret here in Central Park. Uh, I'm not gonna give you the exact, exact location for this spike. You're gonna have to do a little bit of exploring if you wanna find this, but you can certainly find plenty of information available online and a fun little adventure to take in Central Park to try to find this. As we move past that grid marker spike, we'll make our way to another interesting stone we can see over near the uh, Sheep Meadow area of Central Park. As we make our way over, we're coming over to Sheep Meadow, and we can see certainly one of our favorite meadows and areas in the park, one that offers a nice expanse, as well as some interesting bedrock popping throughout the lawn here. We can also see some stones, though, that are nicely decorating the southeast corner. And these stones are not necessarily bedrock like schist, but rather other types of conglomerate stones that were brought here. They were brought here by that glacier we talked about earlier. These are known as glacial erratics, and glacial erratics can be found throughout New York and all throughout the U.S. These are stones that were transported with a glacier, and they were left in various areas. This might not have been left directly in this area, but the designers of Central Park, Calvert Vox and Frederick Law Olmsted, loved the natural geology and used decoration wherever they could. Some of these stones can be seen throughout all of New York and all of Central Park. And it's really interesting to think of how far these stones may have traveled, potentially having come from really far up from Western Canada all the way down to here. As we make our way away from Sheep Meadow, we're gonna be walking now just Southwest as we head to a last little stop or two on our walk today. And as we make our way down, we can notice some other decorative rocks placed around, making our way a little bit closer to this exposed cropping. We can see a little boulder or a large boulder that's decoratively placed on top of this clump of Manhattan schist. And beyond, of course, stones that were transported here, even stones that were naturally occurring here or ones that were blasted off from larger chunks of bedrock have certainly been incorporated into design and beauty all throughout the park. You'll notice this one has some spikes holding it up because although it uh, doesn't really seem like it's going anywhere, just in case they'll pre uh, prevent it from sliding down. And of course, many, many people over the years have tried to push and dislodge this rock, but to no avail. But if anybody would like to try, you can find this rock located near the northeast corner of Hector Ball Fields, adding a little bit of decoration to our view looking southwest. As we make our way down, we're coming to our last stop on our tour today. So as we make our way down, I do want to launch a last poll, which is if you have a favorite rock cropping here in Central Park. There's a lot of different rock croppings, and I've included just a few of our favorite ones. But certainly feel free to vote in that as we make our way down towards the southwest area of the park making our way to our final stop, their famous and favorite rock face for a lot of people here in the park, one known as Umpire Rock. As we make our way over to Umpire Rock, we can see really the beauty and the lift of some areas of the rock. Looking at the south or the eastern section of Umpire Rock, we can see just how tall that area gets, probably upwards of about 16 to 18 feet or so, adding a nice little kind of uh, drastic cliff looking area, as well as providing a wonderful area for people to climb. We'll see boulders, uh, people bouldering on rocks like this and seeing their marks left behind, those chalky white marks. There's also something else though that I noticed right here. You might have noticed this kind of different colored stone patch. This is, I'm actually not sure if this is a type of foliation or fold, or if this is going to be considered a dike. A dike is considered um, really a type of, uh, really an area where magma might shoot through a crack or broken area of rock in between and eventually kind of cooling off, creating a separate band or patch of rock. We can see the stone highlighted in this red um, rectangle type area is actually a little bit different looking than surrounding Manhattan schist. This might be um, like a 
pegmatite or feldspar clump, but it's certainly a little bit different than the surrounding schist. So this is a cool example of potentially a dike or foliation in the Manhattan schist. But there's a lot of really interesting geological effects that we can find in this rock if we take a little bit closer of a look. And this is an area I certainly passed by many of times, but I've never really truly noticed this separation of the rock. So if we take our time and become a little bit more mindful passing through the park, we can make a lot of really cool discoveries like this one. As we start to climb to the top of the rock, we can go from an area that was snowy and devoid of people to one that is sunny and filled with people. Like a lot of people, uh, it reminds me of a lot of people like lizards on top of a hot rock as we soak in the nice warm sunshine on this hot Manhattan schist bedrock, looking over those uh, very, very large skyscrapers. And as we make our way to the top, although a lot of us are looking at the buildings, I'm always looking at the ground and the beautiful patterns that we see. One of the reasons we have a lot of skyscrapers in Manhattan is because of our very sturdy bedrock. It is a myth that there are no skyscrapers in the area below of Midtown because of the bedrock. The bedrock does range in different areas all throughout Manhattan. We will see in some areas it being very shallow and some areas it being very deep. We can see in areas like Times Square, the bedrock only being about 18 feet below the surface, where in Greenwich Village, it'll be 260 feet below the surface. So we will see buildings slightly becoming affected by that, but also because of other reasons. But we do see largely New York's massive, massive skyscraper growth being because of our sturdy, stable bedrock, which allows us a wonderful foundation for building on. Looking over the rock, we can also see how the rock has been, of course, incorporated into the landscape. And the landscape has been incorporated around the rock, really using the natural geology and topography of the park to indicate where features might go. And Hector Playground is one of the coolest, in my opinion, examples of the rock meeting with urban architecture. We can see this section of Hector Playground literally takes you into the Manhattan schist, combining the natural playground with a human constructed one that came around 1934. We can certainly see some of these beautiful updates that would eventually make their way into Hector Playground, helping to incorporate more of the natural landscape, like this example. Certainly a really amazing rock that we can see here. And as we look down, we can enjoy the sunny side of the park, one that certainly exposes us to a lot of major skyscrapers, some of which again are here because of that wonderful, beautiful bedrock. And as we uh, end that last poll, I do want to just share the results that we have. And we see a lot of people voting for one of my favorite rocks, which is Vista Rock, the one over where Belvedere Castle is. Of course, there's a lot of wonderful rocks we visited on our tour today. Uh, Overlook Rock, we kind of breezed by but didn't get too much of a look at Cat Rock, but we did see that a few weeks ago we visited the dairy. Uh, Vista Rock, so it was wonderful. We didn't get a chance to make it up to Summit Rock or the Block House, but we certainly are down now at the Umpire Rock, certainly a favorite of ours. And as we look around Umpire Rock, I always prefer looking more towards the north, because when we look to the north, we get a little bit of a view of, of course, the park, a little bit of a reason as to why this is called Umpire Rock because of its look over the Hexer ball fields. And of course, a little bit of a point of view or perspective of just how massive and just how wonderful these rocks are in affecting our enjoyment of the park, giving us a little bit of an uplift and giving us a different perspective for the park that we know and love so much. As we come to the end of our walk, I want to thank you for hanging with us and learning a little bit about the geology of Central Park, because Central Park certainly rocks. And as we make our way to the end of the tour, I want to also, again, remind you to join us for some of our other programs. Uh, we do have, of course, a lot of specialty programs coming up. We do have tomorrow two Seneca Villages tours, one at 11 a.m. in person, as well as a virtual tour at 2 p.m. And find the links in the chat for, uh, that Jose will be dropping. And of course, as you can see on the screen here, we are going to have the Gateway to Harlem, the creation of the Frederick Douglass Circle Monument occurring tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. This is a once uh, a one occurring tour, so we'd love to have you attend and see you there. Uh, we do, of course, have this promo code that you can write down, screenshot, or scan the QR code using your phone, which will get you $5 off. 
Uh, thank you again, though, for joining us today, learning a little bit about the geology of the park and hopefully having a fun time as we make our way to, through, and climbing up some of these massive rock outcroppings in Central Park. The next time you join us in the park and you visit one of these massive rock faces, just remember you're standing on something that's over 450 million years old, something that the dinosaurs could have even seen. Uh, but really amazing. And again, thank you for joining us and learning a little bit about wonderful geological history in the park. I will keep this open for a little bit longer in case anybody would like to take a picture of this or in case you have any last minute questions that we can answer for you. Um, again, thank you so much for your support. Uh, I'm going to again keep this room open and we hope to see you on uh, future programs, both in person and virtual. Thank you so much for joining us and from all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, stay safe, be well, and we'll see you soon.